guest this evening is an empire in the history department of our university. Uh, her name is Dr. Rachel Constance. And Rachel uh, wrote this little introduction, uh, which will give you a sense of who she is, where she's from, and why she's interested in what we're doing. At Northern Arizona University, I studied European and Roman history with a focus on imperialism and a history of oceans. That is, I studied regions like the Mediterranean and the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean as discrete geographic locations. In this perspective, the communities that shared borders with the water shared many common cultural, economic, and social characteristics made possible by the movement of maritime vessels. In my research, I focus in particular on the ways in which knowledge is exchanged through transoceanic networks. I am using the, uh, this approach to talk about the Roman Empire and its relationship with provinces, neighbors, and other parts of the world in this evening's talk. Uh, I look forward to uh, having Rachel's wisdom, and it is my pleasure to present to Dr. Rachel Constance. Thank you. 
as a training course, not a Mediterranean. And the reason that I think it's important to talk about the Carthaginians in the context of Rome is because the Carthaginians are largely the map on which the Romans sort of establish you know, their maritime empire. And so the Carthaginians are the group of people with whom the Romans are beginning to come into conflict with as they're expanding across the Italian peninsula. And it wasn't inevitable necessarily that these two groups would come into conflict, but it ultimately ends up happening that you have an uneasy relationship to begin with. Um, the Carthaginians were very wary of the fact that the Romans were um, sort of taking control of the Italian peninsula, and in particular, getting very close to their trading partners on the island of Sicily, which you can kind of see up here. In particular, um, you know, they, they would trade with the city of Syracuse. So what ends up happening, the spark that lights the fire, so to speak, um, is that a group of mercenaries invade the tiny little city-state of Masana. Now, the important thing about Masana is that it's located literally right up here, near the very tip of the Italian boot, on the island of Sicily. So these mercenaries take control of the city of Masana, and then immediately the city of Syracuse, you know, is kind of unhappy about this place, and so they go to try to take it back. These mercenaries send letters to both Rome and Carthage, asking for assistance, basically protection against the, Syrac uh, against the Syracusans. And the Carthaginians are the ones who respond first. And they go in and they essentially establish a military garrison in Masana, which is, again, right at the very toe of the Italian peninsula, right at the very door of Roman power. And so the Romans, who had also responded to this kind of crisis, the Romans end up you know, arriving at Masana, and there's this major maritime power with whom they already had this like, uneasy relationship with, um, and they were very concerned about it. They end up getting into a massive war, which then is largely started over this kind of such a tiny little city state, and as a result, Carthage ends up losing. And the story of how that happens is, is kind of long, but basically what the Romans do is they make this decision that, as it turns out, is a very faithful decision. Uh, they decide to build a navy. And ironically, uh, they're able to do so in part by uh, building models off of a sunken Carthaginian vessel that they find located in the Mediterranean. And by establishing the navy, they're able to turn what had been their land-based authority, you know, this ability to uh, fight effectively on land, they're able to transfer that into sea power. And in doing that, they're able to gain control uh, of the islands of Sicily, Sardinia, and Corsica, I believe. And you know, effectively put Carthage in their place. Not destroy Carthage at this point, um, but certainly to sort of put a check on their power. And Carthage is forced to pay a huge indemnity to Rome, you know, so they have to pay them because they were in a war, they were the ones that lost, so the, the Carthaginians are sending a lot of money to the Romans. And this in part cripples the Carthaginian economy a little bit so that they can't go right out and start another war again. So this takes place uh, in 264 BC, just to give you a sense of the time as far as that goes. Now, more, now what was to have two more conflicts with Carthage uh, that are significant, and I have just talked about them very briefly, but the second one begins in 218 BC, and in some ways this is the more significant of the final two Punic Wars, what the Romans refer to as the Punic Wars. And what happens is, it, again, it starts in a quarrel over a tiny little in this case, it's one in Spain, the city of Sagonta. Now, what ended up happening is that uh, the Carthaginians began messing around with Sagonta when they weren't supposed to. They had been sort of steadily moving into Spain. This wasn't even Roman territory. It was totally uh, within their right to do so. They had trading colonies in Spain long before the Romans had even begun expanding across Italy. And so the, the Carthaginians had every right to be there. But the Romans had established and set up a relationship with this tiny city-state, and they basically told them, you know, if you want to pick a fight with the Carthaginians, we will back you up militarily. And that's exactly what happened. But something, then something occurred that the Romans didn't expect. The Romans had expected that this was going to be a war that was fought overseas. They thought that they were going to fight in North Africa, and they thought that they were going to fight in Spain. And that didn't happen. The Carthaginians, led by their general, by a brilliant man by the name of Hannibal, marched across the Alps, and legend has it even brought more elements with him, though I'm not sure whether they actually survived the trek over the Alps. Um, he was rumored to have a massive army. He marched them all over the Alps, 
and invaded Italy from the north, heading the south. And he was massively successful in these battles, um, invading the Italian peninsula. And there's a variety of reasons uh, why this may have been. Um, the largest argument that I have seen in the literature is that there's incompetence on the part of Roman generals. Uh, Rome at this point, politically speaking, is starting to have problems. And so as a result, he's winning victory after victory. And it gets to the point where the Romans, uh, Roman allies on the Italian peninsula, and also on the uh, the big city states and what's left in the Hellenistic kingdoms, are starting to get this sense that maybe Rome is going to lose. And at least one of them, Philip of Mascon, actually sent a letter to Hannibal suggesting, well, maybe we need to establish a relationship, you know. And he ends up getting caught, and he'll pay for that later. And the Romans caught him, intercepted this letter, uh, and they end up making Philip pay for that decision. But the, the important thing to know about this time is that, you know, it's, there's no guarantee that the Romans are going to, to win this conflict. But they do. And so the question is, why? Well, what ends up happening is that the Romans need, like, a major trade change of plan. So they do what they had originally wanted to do to begin with. And that was they brought the fight home to the Carthaginians with an invasion of the Carthaginian homeland. And when they did that, Hannibal was recalled by his own people. And so he was forced to leave Italy, essentially abandon his attempt to conquer the Italian peninsula, which was to that point very successful, and return home. And he had to fight the Romans in North Africa. And at the Battle of Zama, this is when they lose. And they lose you know, pretty, pretty badly. And once again, you have the same sort of situation that's set up, where they have to pay this huge indemnity. But Carthage is largely left in place. But the Romans had established a significant hatred for the Carthaginians by this point. Many of them believed that Carthage was, Carthage was always going to be a threat to Rome. It needed to be wiped off the face of the map. And in fact, uh, there was a legend that says there was at least one Roman statesman who every time he got the floor of the Roman Senate, he would stand up there and he would shout, Carthage must be destroyed. And he would insist this every time he got the floor. Carthage must be destroyed. But here's the thing that you need to understand about Roman imperialism. The Romans didn't fight wars of conquest, as far as they were concerned. They never fought strictly for the purpose of conquering the territory. They fought wars of defense. And Roman writers, all the way through the, the, the empire period, continually insisted on this. The battle at Masana, well, that was just the Romans answering a call for help from an ally. They had answered this call for help, and then, oops, suddenly they have an empire in the Mediterranean. How did that happen? Uh, and all of their wars of conquest are ultimately framed as defensive wars, with the Romans going to the aid of their allies. And this is how it's framed over and over and over again in the literature. There is no actual Roman imperial policy. They don't have um, anything that suggests that they were deliberately going out and conquering. Now, there's two problems with this there, right? Number one is the fact that they constantly were in conflict with their neighbors it suggests that clearly this was not a peaceful people by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, you know, so they have this 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 war culture, and this is something I think that's important to understand as far as the Romans go. This, this war culture that they have. The main reason that they would fight wars were glory and gold. And most wars were directed by the elites, and they were the ones who benefited the most from these uh, wars of conquest, which were actually wars of defense, which were actually uh, wars designed to bring, bring glory and gold to the people. And everybody benefited from warfare, so it's not simply the elites. I mean, the elites might be the ones that started, but all of the common soldiers are able to um, engage and, and to uh, be part of this treasure as well. And so, you know, war is, is inherent in Roman culture. And so that's part of the reason why, you know, these are probably not strictly wars of defense, whatever the Romans might have thought. So, now, so this is what happens when you, when you go off. Sorry, I lost my place. Okay, Carthage. So what ends up happening with Carthage? After the Second Carthaginian War, you have some Romans who are uh, absolutely, absolutely determined that Carthage must be destroyed. But the Romans are not interested in simply destroying Carthage for the sake of destroying Carthage. They need to have a reason. They need to be provoked. Now, under the terms of the Treaty Agreement with Rome, the Carthaginians 
a creed that they would not make war on their own. They had essentially been reduced to a vassal state of, of the Roman Empire, and Rome, by the way, had gained control of all of Spain after the Second War. So this is where we see them gaining most of the control over their Mediterranean Empire. But they don't really have much of a foothold in North Africa at this point, um, with the exception of this gateway that is Carthage. And so uh, the Carthaginians are not allowed to make war. But there's one problem with this, and that is that uh, this northern empire, this northern part of Africa, was not empty. And it hadn't been empty when the Carthaginians first arrived there and first started establishing colonies. They put those colonies there for a reason. They were engaging in trade with the local people, a local groups of people known as the Berbers. And the Berbers, some of them were settled agriculturalists, but some of them were pastoral nomads. And they were the ones who knew the secrets to the Trans-Saharan gold trade. And this is one of the secrets to Carthaginian wealth. It's that they're getting quite a lot of this gold that's coming through the western part of Africa. And so uh, the Romans have an interest, certainly, in gaining control of this gold trade. But they, they need a reason to attack Carthage. And the reason comes in the form of a battle that takes place. The Carthaginians had been at constantly, uh, constantly at war, increasingly, with the emerging Berber kingdoms, it's called the Berber kingdoms were referred to by the Romans as Numidia, or the Numidian kingdoms. They were at war with an emerging Berber king uh, who was constantly raiding and Carthage's uh, trading routes, dealing and also uh, raiding their lands. Particularly, you know, they were messing with Carthage's food supply <coughs> and gold supply. Both of these things were problematic, understandably, for the Carthaginians. And the Carthaginians were forbidden by the terms of this agreement with Rome. They were forbidden to engage in warfare, to respond. So they sent messengers, they sent uh, anybody, anything that they could think of, they sent to the Senate, begging for assistance, and the Romans ignored them. And finally, the Carthaginians just decided, enough is enough, we'll take the consequences. Maybe the Romans are going to be too busy to deal with us. Um, because this time, the Romans had begun engaging in wars in the East, taking control of the old Hellenistic kingdoms. And so the Carthaginians do, in fact, attack the Numidian kingdoms. And the minute they do it, the minute they do it, it begins the third and final Punic War. The Romans uh, finally have their reason to go in and clear Carthage out completely. Carthage wasn't really in a position to defend itself. Um, they did their best. You know, they were able to keep them out for a while, but ultimately Carthage falls and is wiped essentially off the map. Their women and children especially are sold into slavery. And this entire province that had once belonged to the Carthaginian, Carthaginians is now entirely under the control of Rome. And the Romans call this new province of theirs Africa. And so this is the beginning of the Roman Empire in Africa. So soon after the defeat of the Carthaginians, we see the Romans return to their conquests in the east. They begin continuing to establish their imperial control over all of these territories that had once been part of Macedonia. Um, for those of you that are familiar with uh, a little bit of Greek history, Alexander the Great um, had a vast empire that included parts of Eastern Europe, um, a large chunk of Asia, and also Egypt. And those kingdoms had split, and had split into three major kingdoms after his death. Uh, and this is what Rome moves into control. And part of the reason, again, it's framed as a defensive uh, war, the Romans are really there, though, because these are some of the wealthiest areas uh, in the world. And they're there largely to gain control of um, the vast amount of gold that's available in these eastern provinces. Now, the problem is that as the Romans are gaining control of these territories, as they're continuing to grow and get larger and larger, um, a number of things are happening within the, the, the within Rome itself. Now, up to this point, Rome had been a republic, and it was and it was run that way. The problem was that the, the systemic structures of the republic were no longer capable of handling uh, this imperial issue. And there's a lot of there's a, this, these imperial conflicts, these extensive territories that have been added on to Rome. And there's a lot of reasons for this which I'm not going to go into, because unfortunately that's one of my weak areas. But, uh, to say the least, essentially what it looked like was this. Uh, 
Roman, the Roman military, what they would do is they had these, they had their farmers who would work part time, they would serve part time in the military, and you were only allowed to serve in the military if you owned your own land. So part of the year you would be at home, you know, on the Italian peninsula, growing things to feed the empire, and then the other part of the year you would be out engaging in wars of conquest. Now you can see where the problem lies with this, is that the further that Rome goes, I mean they're all the way in Spain for heaven's sake, they're all the way in, in Asia, the further away that they're bringing these people from, from home, the harder it is to get them back. And so a lot of these small landowning farmers are losing their farms. They're going deeply, deeply into debt because they're not getting back into the line to work the land, to sell their produce, to do all that stuff. Uh, and then once they don't have land, they either have to, you know, they're homeless and they have to go make their way to the city and do something, or they have to sell themselves to their wives and children into slavery. Now, as you can imagine, this is not making for a happy populace. So this is one of the many issues that's sort of underlying uh, the decline of the republic and what is ultimately going to result in the emergence of imperial rule, which takes place under Emperor Augustus, who is this Japanese right here. Now, Augustus was, you probably know at least a little bit about him, perhaps, that he was the grand nephew, I believe, of Julius Caesar. And he sort of emerges as a result of a prolonged power struggle that takes place beginning with uh, the emergence of Marius, the general Marius, who was actually a hero, again, going back to North Africa, um, part of the reason that he is such a, a significant figure is because he was very successful at dealing with the Numidian kingdoms, those Berber kings that I talked about um, in North Africa that were largely responsible for uh, eliminating Carthage, at least in part. Um, Marius, as it turned out, was very successful at dealing with these Berber kings, and this is part of the reason why um, he's put in power in Rome for an extended period of time. And it's the situation that happens with General Marius, along with some of the reforms that he makes to the army, and the biggest thing he does solves Rome's biggest problem, and that is he eliminates the property requirements for serving in the military. Now all of a sudden, all of these landless farmers can go back, they have a job, they're getting a steady paycheck, they don't have to go home and work on the farm anymore, they can go and, and live permanently in garrisons around the empire or engage in these long distance wars. That problem's been solved, but they're not loyal to the empire necessarily, which the republic has. Uh, that was one of the original purposes of having this citizen, this farmer-soldier idea, is that they figured if you owned your own land, you were invested in protecting it, you were invested in protecting the republic. And this is gone by the time Marius eliminates the property requirement. And so Marius essentially creates uh, a series of military, uh, of military men, professional military men, who are responsible, um, who are loyal only to him. And then he will be the first in a series of generals that includes Sulla, um, of course Julius Caesar had uh, devoted, a devoted following amongst his own army. Um, he is the first in a series of generals who will effectively uh, enable the creation of the Roman Empire, uh, this consolidation of power under a single entity, and that is the very first, of course, is Emperor Augustus. Now, Augustus didn't consider himself an emperor, or he did, he did consider himself an emperor, he didn't call himself that. The time period uh, that, uh, that Augustus was the leader, he referred himself as the principal citizen of the, this is the principal period in Roman history, and after that, they sort of dropped this pretense that, he's, that it's not an imperial position. Um, but during this time period, he makes it seem as though they have reestablished the republic. Uh, so there's this sense that he is, you know, um, as far as the other senators go, he is their equal, even though in practice, he's not. Like, all decisions are made by him. But it's under Augustus that we first begin to see the subject states of Rome, the provinces. Uh, we start to begin to see the beginnings of this kind of veneration of the emperor as a godlike figure. <clears throat> now, to many of these subject peoples, he was a godlike figure. You know, he's very distant, he's very cool. Uh, you know, he's all powerful, as far as we can tell. And there's also this sense that, you know, this is the person that we can approach. This is so, this is if we want favors, if we want things like that. We don't have to go and try to deal with the Senate. You know, we can just go straight to the emperor, and he is the one who's the arbiter of all decisions. And the, you know, having an emperor, having a single person who's making the decisions for Rome, ends up ultimately being a much more effective 
of managing the empire provides a level of stability that had been lacking to that point. But as I was talking about, the way that the, that the emperor comes to be venerated as a god, uh, this begins actually originally in the east amongst what happened the Hellenic states. Now there's a couple of reasons why they start to, to sort of regard him as a god, in part because as I said, he's got this kind of uh, you know, aura around him. It's all powerful, that sort of thing. But the Greek city-states had, since the time of Alexander, gotten used to venerating their rulers as divine or semi-divine figures. So this was something that was a, a very long tradition. Not to mention, the Greeks had actually supported Mark Antony and Cleopatra um, in their bid for taking control of power after Julius Caesar was killed. And so they really had to suck up, so to speak, quite a lot to atone for as far as Augustus was concerned. So they built temples in his honor, um, and we start to see him being literally worshipped as if he were a god. And over time, this ultimately evolves into the cult of the emperor, where you have to pray to the emperor and things like that. And over the course of this time period, between the time of Augustus and the time of Constantine, this is where we start seeing, as well, the emergence of Christianity from simply being you know, a very small, kind of isolated sect to increasingly becoming um, sort of a force, an undercurrent, particularly amongst the poverty classes. Now the reason that the poverty classes took to Christianity so quickly is in part because it's a very egalitarian religion in many you know, And Rome was not an egalitarian empire. In fact, it had some very severe class issues. Um, there are people who become very, very, very wealthy in the empire. And at the same time, you have people who are very, very, very poor. And so, in a sense, uh, you know, Christianity is kind of bringing out these class tensions within the empire. And so, everywhere, we see Christians, of course, who refuse to worship the emperor. And because it's a crime to not worship the emperor or to ill wish the emperor, many of them end up being lions. Um, you know, they get thrown in gladiator rings or killed for sport or simply burned on the spot. But it depended on where you were. If you were in a very remote outpost where the provincial governor really didn't have a lot of money or manpower, uh, you could get away with simply, you know, if you were caught, for example, with Christian scripture, you could get away with simply saying things like, you know, I, I, I up, I'm not Christian, I denounce it, and they would let you walk away without even jail time. Uh, and this happened a lot, for example, in North Africa. <laughs> so, this is, this is one of those major things. I just wanted to talk very briefly about that. So let me talk more about imperial rule. <coughs> now, it seems very odd that Rome was able to control as much territory as it did for as long as it did. And Rome was a relatively stable empire for quite a long period of time. Now, this territory at its height covered roughly 3,000 miles or more. Uh, they covered 60 million different subjects. And so how exactly are they able to do this? Their army is large, don't get me wrong. They had a standing army of about 150,000 men. Uh, they had another 250,000 auxiliary troops that were at their disposal. But this is nowhere near adequate enough to properly control the territories that they actually had. So what they do is actually very smart. They would establish these military garrisons in the regions that they believed were going to cause the most trouble. And so what they did, what Augustus did originally, was he divided the empire into two parts. On the one hand, you have these territories that are ruled by the people. And these were the safe areas. These areas had uh, proconsuls. Um, they really didn't have any military garrisons in them at all. These were people who were um, habituated to obedience. So places like Spain, for example, were never really volatile areas. So they didn't have uh, the same military presence that you see in places like, for example, Britannia, which is kind of infamous, right, for uh, you know, the fractious uh, relationship that it had with the local tribes. And the Gauls, for a while, had been a very fractious tribe. But uh, by this point, by the first century CE, they had sort of established a peaceable relationship with Rome and are, in effect, uh, many ways becoming Romanists. And I'll talk more about Romanization in a second. So you had the provinces that were the people's provinces, and then you had the emperor's provinces. And these are the territories that are controlled by the emperor. And this is where he sends the bulk of his military forces. And so places like Britannia, um, North Africa, is another major place where there constantly has to be a military presence 
in order to make sure that the local population doesn't rebel. And North Africa was particularly important for a number of reasons. But the big one is that, contrary to what we imagine North Africa as being, you know, when you think about North Africa, you think about the Sahara Desert, right? The coastal area of North Africa was at the time some of the most productive agricultural land in all of Rome. And it was absolutely vital to keep that food supply secure. And when the Romans took control of North Africa, and they ended up controlling uh, pretty much the entire coast of North Africa, uh, they doubled and tripled in some places grain production, olive production, um, and they taxed the farmers heavily in the form of food particularly. And all of that was shipped to feed the Italian peninsula, and particularly the city of Rome. And this is part of the reason why later on Rome's going to run into trouble when the vandals come in and, and cut them off of North Africa. Uh, they cut off that vital grain supply and essentially make it very difficult for um, the Romans to govern their own territories because hungry people are not quite the same place. So it was absolutely vital that they had those garrisons in North Africa to protect that grain supply that was feeding the Italian peninsula. So this is um, one of the strategic ways in which they're able to kind of manage their empire. Now one of the key methods in which they were able to secure control in Rome was through a process known as Romanization. And what this basically means is that peoples who were their, largely their imperial subjects, they would ultimately end up being, becoming uh, Roman in many ways. Typically they would maintain a lot of their own cultural ideas, but they would, for example, start speaking Latin. Uh, they would adopt Roman styles of dress. Uh, they would adopt Roman styles of governance. You know, they would read Roman literature. They would become, in many ways, very Roman-like. And in certain cases, they would even go so far as to become citizens. And I'll talk more, uh, a little bit more about that as we go, because um, I'm going to talk specifically, uh, more specifically about a particular province on the next slide. But what you need to understand about Romanization is that one of the major ways in which people would become Romanized was by joining the army. And this was uh, a major career of a very uh, popular career for people at this time period because, number one, you were generally paid very well. Uh, it was a steady paycheck that you could keep for yourself or you could send your family, whatever you needed to do. Uh, it was largely a life commitment. You had to serve for 25 years. But if you did your 25 years, you got basically a pension. You were given some land somewhere in the empire. Now, the problem with this is that not all land is created equal, right? So if you were really unlucky, you would end up with some rock in the middle of the desert. But many people were, were given land that was agriculturally productive, typically in areas where they had been garrisoned their entire lives. So many soldiers, for example, who were sent to Britain or who were sent to North Africa would live, do, out, do their 25 years of service, and then they would end up settling where they had lived largely their whole lives anyway, and marry into the local population. But when they joined the army, and most of the people who chose to join the army came from very poor families, uh, you know, they would come in with, with very poor custom, you know, or they would cut, have their own customs, um, but they would be, for example, they would have very different standards of bathing. Uh, and the Roman army made sure that they had new standards of cleanliness. They had to, of course, learn Latin if they were going to be in the army. Uh, they had to adopt Roman religious customs if they were going to be in the army. And so it's through this process that people who come from very different cultural backgrounds ultimately end up um, gaining an interest in the Roman Empire. And the other thing that you should know is that if you served your 25 years of service, um, you could also become a citizen, and you would have political rights within the empire. Right, so this is how the Romans were able to control so much territory for such a long time. So let me talk a little bit more specifically. Um, I have two more things that I want to do well, in the time that I have. I want to talk a little bit more specifically about Rome's relationship with its provinces, and I'm going to focus again on North Africa, uh, in part because that's what I know, and it's what I know fairly well, uh, in part because most people don't think about North Africa when they think about the Roman Empire, right? I mean, we think a lot about Britain, or we think about you know, the Eastern Roman Empire, but we don't really talk much in history about everything that's going on um, in North Africa, and this is, as I've mentioned, a fairly significant area. You know, it's, it's North Africa that ultimately is the reason that Rome even becomes an empire to begin with. And so I want to focus specifically on the, what are the, what were the Bourbon kingdoms, um, these territories that come to be known as Africa, Numidia, and Mauritania. And for those of you that are Shakespeare fans, 
give our term more, uh, you know, the Moors of Spain. Um, that comes from modern time. So given some of its imperialist origins, uh, you know, the Romans had something of an antagonistic relationship with the Roman right? I mean, that's, that's fairly clear. But its relationship with the provinces, well, in some cases it can be antagonistic as well, particularly the further you are away from uh, the imperial center. You know, the Greek city-states are largely the ones um, that are the most secure, and even Egypt really never gave the Romans too much trouble. But both of these are located relatively close to the center of Roman power. North Africa, however, uh, in many cases, was a little bit different. Now, the Numidian elites, the Berber elites, were in many cases highly Romanized. So, you know, they do. They, they go through this process of Romanization. They begin adopting Roman dress. Uh, they begin learning Latin. Uh, most of them, many of them become very wealthy, either from serving in the army or from establishing trade contracts, uh, trade contacts around the Roman Empire uh, that, and between the Roman Empire, I should say, and that Trans-Saharan gold trade, which continues to be a major force during this time period, um, they are able to become incredibly wealthy. Now, as I said, the, the Numidians had been a kingdom long before the Romans arrived, and they're located in what is now modern-day Algeria and Tunisia. And I talked a little bit about their relationship with Carthage, and I talked a little bit about um, how it was in North Africa uh, that uh, Marius is first establishing his power base on um, that, you know, sort of launches road from on uh, the road to empire. Now, originally, the Romans saw the Numidian kingdoms as potential allies. There was really no intent to uh, absorb them into their empire as it, as, the, as it was. But over time, they increasingly began to see it as expedient to kind of bring them into their circle. And again, it's framed in terms of these defensive wars. You know, the Numidian kings are causing problems, and the Romans themselves begin interfering with uh, Numidian politics, ultimately causing the disturbances that require the Roman Empire and their army to come in and ultimately take control of all these provinces. So of course they had gotten Africa first as a result of the wars with Carthage, and then from there they were able to get Numidia, North and Mauritania, and also parts of Libya. Okay, so the political independence of these kingdoms ended roughly around 50 CE. And one of the major issues that we see taking place in these Berber kingdoms is the pastoral nomads are a constant, constant threat to the agriculturalists who live on the very edge of the Roman Empire. And as you can see, they never really penetrate um, the Romans do. They never really penetrate very deep into North Africa. And in part, this is because, you know, you can see exactly where the agricultural land ends, uh, and it's right about where the Roman border is. So they weren't particularly interested in the uh, semi-arid territory that was rapidly becoming desert. Um, the Sahara was in this sort of constant process of growing at this time period. So at the very edge of those borders, you see these Saharan, uh, I'm sorry, you see these pastoral nomads <coughs> kind of raising their sheep, they're raising their cattle in some cases, uh, and they're sort of moving along the edge of the empire and occasionally making raids onto this agricultural territory that is supposed to be controlled by the Romans. Now, in exchange for the heavy taxation that the Romans were imposing on all of these uh, Numidian farmers in these rural agricultural areas, the Romans were supposed to be responsible for defending these borders. They're supposed to be setting, you know, setting up these military garrisons to kind of block uh, the axis of these pastoral nomads. And the reality of the situation is that's not at all what's happening in fact. Because the taxation was so bad, it was actually more in their interest, in the interest of these agriculturalists, uh, to ally with the nomads to keep the tax collector on. And in many cases, that's exactly what they did. You know, nobody likes to pay taxes. And there wasn't a lot that the Romans could do about it um, in cases like that when it happened. Because most of the, the people who were stationed in North Africa were actually North Africans. Now, through this process of Romanization, what we see taking place, uh, many of these elites are able to um, establish themselves in the military, and once they have served their 25 years, they gain citizenship, and once they're citizens, 
they're allowed to, to participate in the political process. They actually, in many cases, are able to go on and establish themselves in politics. And so just to give you some examples, if I can find my pages, my page here, um, just to give you a couple of examples, we actually see some of these Dominion uh, elites going on to serve uh, as very high-ranking officials in the Roman Empire. So in 117, for example, um, the governor of Judea was, in fact, a Numidian, a Berber by the name of uh, Lucius Quiet, which is probably not how it's pronounced, so I apologize for my, for my Latin. But we do see one of these North Africans going on to be established as a provincial governor. And in fact, we see them going to hold the highest office in the Roman Empire. Uh, there was a Berber emperor, Zephyrus Septimus. And so North Africans were very highly involved I need to turn my back on you. North Africans are very highly involved in the political process. And this is largely takes place through this relationship that they have with the Roman military and this opportunity that they gain in terms of becoming you know, full participants in the political process. Now, another thing that we see happening at this time period is we see later on the spread of Christianity all the way across North Africa. And surprisingly, it doesn't come via the sea. This is normally how these networks work, is they establish these connections between these city-states. Uh, but this is the case with Christianity. Christianity makes its very slow way from Egypt all the way across the northern part of Africa. And actually, it gains quite a lot of converts. And part of the reason for that is that all the way up until uh, the time of Constantine, Christianity wasn't precisely popular with Roman, with Roman elites. So amongst the rural Berbers, amongst the rural Numidians, and the Libyans and the Mauritanians, uh, taking up Christianity is kind of a way of resisting Roman rule. You know, so they like anything that the uh, Roman elites do not like. And this continues onward, even after Christianity becomes the state religion, we end up seeing in North Africa, um, you know, the North Africans choose to reject the traditional doctrine of Christianity uh, and kind of take on a separatist uh, interpretation, so to speak. And I'm not going to go into uh, all the details about that, but needless to say, uh, one of the most famous figures to sort of come out of this time period you might be familiar with, um, Augustine of Hippo, was in fact from North Africa as well. And he sort of emerged as a result of some of these um, internecine conflicts that are taking place. So that is um, an example of Rome's relationship with this province. Uh, with its provinces and the changes that are taking place at that time. But what about Rome and the world? What is Rome's relationship with the wider world? Um, because we sort of have this sense, I think, it's very easy to kind of get caught up in this idea of the Roman Empire as being um, an, an independent entity that's not really connected to anything else, in part because it is so vast, right? Um, it's so large that it's easy to kind of think of Rome as the center of the world. But in reality, Rome is very much connected to other major territories worldwide. And one of the major ways in which they were connected goes back to this idea that I was talking about, this idea of the sea. And in particular, the Mediterranean uh, you know, enabled Roman dominance in Europe and in Africa. But it was through Egypt and the connections with the Red Sea that they had, in part because of their connection to Egypt, that enables them to make connections to places as far away as China. And here's how it went. Basically, the Romans, uh, when they were taking control of Egypt, they came into contact with a very, a relatively old civilization uh, that at the time was called Axum, the Kingdom of Axum. Now, Axum had been around in various manifestations since the time of Pharaonic Egypt. And Axum is located in what is now modern day Ethiopia. Now, at the time that the Romans took control of Egypt, there was a major trading port, and I'm sorry about how tiny this map is, but I wanted to show the extent of Roman trading contacts. Um, they were in charge, the uh, Egyptians were in charge of a very tiny port um, known as Adulis. And Adulis had been originally built by the, Ptolemy, the Ptolemies, who controlled Egypt before the Romans, those Greek, uh, the Macedonian Greeks who had controlled uh, who had been part of, the, of Alexander's empire. And they had built this port of Adulis that was in the Red Sea, and it had trading connections all, in, all up and down the eastern coast of Africa. There's a series of territories you can kind of see from the dots a little bit. 
They had ties there where they collected ivory, um, ivory gold slaves. And they also had trading connections to Southern Arabia and also to India. And then through India, they had connections to the Silk Road, which went all the way to China. So when the Romans took control of Egypt, technically they gained control of this port of Adulis too. Now the problem was that at the same time that they gained control of Adulis, this is where we see the kingdom of Aksum start to really begin flexing its military and economic power. They get into a tussle with the Romans, uh, there's, there's a lot of battles on both sides, and ultimately the Romans end up deciding um, to acknowledge Aksumite authority over this port of Adulis. And uh, the Aksum, the kingdom of Aksum goes on to become extraordinarily wealthy as a result of controlling this port. Now, so this is under Augustus. Augustus is the one that ultimately recognizes Aksum as a, not only a kingdom, but a legitimate trading partner. And so large numbers of Greek and Roman merchants are constantly going into the Red Sea. They'll stop at Adulis, and then they'll make their way down the coast of, North, uh, the coast of Eastern Africa, or in some cases, they'll trade across the Indian Ocean. Now, it was the Aksumites who learned, uh, they probably were not the first to do this, perhaps they learned from the East Africans, but the Aksumites were familiar with the secret of trading across the Indian Ocean. And the secret to trading across the Indian Ocean is understanding the weather patterns, the monsoons. During certain times of year, um, you can travel very quickly from east to west, uh, and there are certain months that you can't travel at all. Uh, and then in the other half of the year, you can travel the opposite direction. And it's much, much faster than doing what is sort of traditional, what we see in the Mediterranean Sea um, and other parts, and that's just kind of hopping from place to place. You know, cutting across the Indian Ocean can take weeks of a trading journey, and time is money, right? Uh, so this was a huge, a hugely important thing. And there are primary sources that document the significance of this port, this Aksumite port of the Dulles, uh, the Paraclusa, the Erythrean Sea, which is basically like, you know, farmers for the ancient world. Like it describes all of these major city-states. Like, if you are a trader, you want to have a copy of this book because, you know, it tells you the type of people you're going to run into, um, what the best ports are, it describes all the harbors. Um, from a historical standpoint, it's a really useful primary source. Um, but what they say about this port of the Dulles is that this is a great city, a city full of stone, um, with wealth, with, you know, excellent rulers, um, and this is the greatest ivory port, they say, um, in Northern Africa. And, you know, Northern Africa, I should add this, because we don't normally think of Northern Africa in terms of elephants, right? Um, but at this time period, before they were hunted into extinction in North Africa, North Africa was absolutely full of, you know, elephants and rhinoceroses, um, all of these creatures that normally we associate with the savannas of Sub-Saharan Africa, um, they were all over this territory. And so this is a huge um, site for trading in ivory. And the Romans knew that. Uh, the Romans could establish themselves, uh, establish trading contacts in cities like Adulis. And then from there, they would themselves go and travel. Um, and there are Roman trading posts, Greek Roman trading posts, that have been ruins that found along the eastern coast, the western coast of India. And from there, it would, you know, Roman goods would travel by relay across the, the Silk Road. And of course, you know, the major goods that, they, that are traveling, either by sea or by land, these are going to be luxury goods, right? Whatever you can travel, whatever can travel very lightly, that can pack, you know, very small, uh, that is going to bring you a lot of money. Those are the only things that are worth you know, making this very expensive journey for. Because uh, you have to hire mercenaries, you have to do all these things to protect yourself. Um, so you need to make sure that it's always going to be profitable. Um, so the major kind of things that we see being traded, as I said, um, silks. And a lot of times they would unravel, they would actually unravel the silk and simply carry the thread and it would be rewoven um, once it reached its final destination. Um, so silk is a big one. Of course, spices you know, are a huge trading item um, that we see taking place across uh, the Indian Ocean as well as across the Silk Roads. And so this is, a, you know, Axum is sort of a really awesome example of Rome's relationship with the wider world. And trade is not the only thing uh, that Axum kind of takes away from its relationship with Rome. Over the long term, you see Christian missionaries making their way into uh, Axum, coming through Alexandria, um, and they establish themselves at the courts of the elites. And they're originally um, brought in as tutors for their children. 
And so the, the missionaries are able to um, teach the children Christian doctrine. The children end up becoming Christian. Um, and over time, we eventually see the entire kingdom of Axum becoming a Christian kingdom. And Ethiopia ended up being a Christian nation. And at the time of the Portuguese uh, invasions of Africa, it's the only Christian kingdom in all of Africa. So they remained Christian for quite a long time. And in fact, later kings in Ethiopia would establish, uh, well, they would establish mythical links um, to Old Testament kings. Uh, so some, for example, trace their, their uh, lineage to Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, or the Queen of Seba, which is in the southern parts of Arabia here. Uh, others would trace their lineage to Moses. So they sort of established a very old kind of Christian tradition as a result of this uh, relationship that they had with Rome and what would eventually become a Christian Rome. I'm like saying, you can tell I'm starting to lose my voice a little bit. So, you know, this is a, a huge impact that Rome ultimately has, um, not only on these territories that are kind of on the borders of its empire, but also in these territories even beyond um, what is essentially the political, uh, the political territory. Um, so in the same way that you know, we sort of see ourselves, you know, the United States is this you know, the superpower that spreads its cultural influence, its cultural, economic, and in some cases military influence worldwide. Rome had largely the same sort of um, relationship in the ancient world. It had established these same sort of connections, um, connections that would have you know, very far-reaching effects. Not simply across space, but also through time. So, I'm done. That's the end of it. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm good. Thank you. So, I guess. Yes. But that was exactly an hour. Pretty good. Um, so, I guess my, I will do my best to answer questions. Um, Could you repeat the questions them. when they're asked, please? Guarantees that I know the answers, though. Could you repeat the questions when they're asked, please? Yes, I can. You mentioned uh, early on, with regards to Carthage and North Africa, that there was a need for a war, a political need for a war, and they looked for an opportunity to have that happen. Was that Roman policy into the empire? The question is, um, was it Roman policy through the time of the empire to have a need to begin a war? And uh, the answer is, I'm not 100 percent sure, but yes, uh, certainly through the time of, uh, through at least the first century CE, even when they were going into Britain, um, it was largely based on this idea of security. Um, the reason that they end up in Britain to begin with is because the Gauls are asking for help. So even extending all the way there, it's largely a result of defense, and it's the same sort of thing. To What is yeah. the total time period that you're addressing here? The total time period? Okay. Um, the Carthaginian Wars <coughs> began in the 3rd century BCE, so around the mid-200s. And I covered, I talked a little bit about Augustus, and that was the 1st century CE. And then uh, the time of Constantine, this is roughly the 4th century CE, so there's a total of probably uh, 500 years that we're talking about. Sorry, the question was, what was the time period? The question was um, the question was did they embrace this theory of, of just war, of a moral war? Um, and the answer is there, there wasn't sort of this um, established policy as far as a warfare, but from what I can tell they did seem to have a sense that that they were very concerned about what their neighbors thought of them. And so I think that the Romans would have said all of their wars of conquest were just wars because they were done in the name of defending other people. But they were influenced by the Greeks, so the Greeks always followed them. They're influenced by the Greeks. They're influenced by the Greeks. Oh, yes. And the Greeks followed the theory of just war. That's a good point. That's a good point, yes. I, the Greeks, the Greeks didn't follow that theory of the just war, and the Romans followed the Greeks. 
So yes, actually that's an excellent point. Yeah, I was thinking they've gone from the best part that we followed in the West of Yes. Yes, language. Uh, you know, they were a very literate people. We just can't actually decipher them. 
provinces because they're establishing these garrisons there, and these garrisons are drawing their recruits from the local population, you know, they're actually creating, so to speak, true believers, people who are invested in Rome, um, who are then influencing other parts of the local population. So they kind of had a mechanism for self-regulation um, through the establishment of their military garrisons, and then through this process of Romanization. And I think that this is, these are some of the major reasons why we see um, Rome ending up being so successful, um, is that so many people end up becoming Romanized, that you know, they kind of end up enshrining um, Roman traditions, you know, right, writing things down, um, and even maintaining like legal systems, long after the Roman Empire itself had sort of passed out of existence, or had sort of um, transformed into a completely different type of institution. Wouldn't you also add to that that the Roman invested in its infrastructure? by creating roads, water, bridges, they were able to allow people to be able to do the things that they needed to do uh, just to wherever they were. Yes. Never, that had never happened really before. Yes. That, that is an excellent point. The question is, wouldn't I also add to that, you know, the fact that the, Rome, the Romans were heavily investing in infrastructure, particularly the construction of roads and things like that, and yes, they were not the first empire to do that. The Persians, for example, um, are well known for establishing a system of roads, uh, you know, in Asia and the Middle East, and that was part of the reason they had, you know, for example, uh, Darius had a very effective coastal system that looked a lot like what you would know as the Pony Express. Um, and they did that in part because it was, you know, expedient to move the military along these roads. And the, and the Romans did the same thing. Um, they established a vast system of very well-built roads um, and continued to invest in them. And the army was one of the groups that was responsible for maintaining these roads. And of course, you know, some of them are even still around. Uh, and they didn't just build roads. They also built quite a lot of uh, maritime infrastructure as well. Uh, they built docks and harbors at their major port cities around the Mediterranean. Um, lighthouses is another major thing that we see taking place. Uh, they were responsible for, you know, for, for building canals. Um, they dredged river channels. They had, uh, you know, military garrisons along the edge of rivers and river cities. So, like, the city of London, for example, is not on the sea, per se, but it's right next to the Thames. Uh, and, you know, the Romans had an army garrison stationed there and, you know, ships that would travel up and, up and down along the channel to kind of protect uh, the trading that was moving through that territory. So, yes, absolutely, infrastructure. And the continuous investment in infrastructure is definitely one of the ways in which Rome is able to maintain their empire. Um, I think being out of uh, principally a, a European context, we tend to look at the Mediterranean as being part of a, a unit with the Atlantic. And in the, the model that you're putting up, um, and I've never really considered in this context, that sort of the Mediterranean and the, and the Indian a, as being a combined I don't know what you would say, point of contact, for lack of a better term. Uh, I know there's been a lot written lately uh, with respect to the Atlantic Basin and how these same types of things you've talked about, you know, have been dealt with, with Spain, Portugal, United States, Britain, that, that, whole, that whole framework there. I'm wondering, looking forward, it seems like the focus is changing again almost like everybody's taking, you know, uh, turns at it. Uh, what might you project in the light of what's going on in the world today with respect to the Pacific Basin, which seems to be undergoing very similar things to the things you've been talking about? Yes, that, that's a wonderful question. Um, the, the, the point that he, that he made is basically that, you know, people have looked at the Atlantic Ocean as a discrete unit of analysis of the connections between Europe and Africa and, and the Americas. And obviously, there's also a huge body of scholarship on the Indian Ocean um, and you know, the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf and the trading contacts and relationships that are taking place there. And so the question is, you know, what about the Pacific Ocean? And the answer is, there is in fact an emerging body of scholarship that is focusing on um, the relationship of territories across the Pacific Rim. And the stuff that I have read, and unfortunately I'm not as well read in the scholarship as I would like to be, because I do think these are all connected. The stuff that I have read is focused main, 
for example, um, the Chinese and the Japanese um, to the western coast of North America, and particularly uh, to San Francisco. And you know, some of the relationships that they have that they set up with you know, the local American population, which is from some of US students of history, uh, very, very contentious, particularly during World War II. But also the way that they're able to try to maintain their own ethnic identity uh, you know, and the connections that they have with the Pacific Rim. And so um, there's much more of this, this focus on, on people at this particular time. But I think that particularly as we become increasingly connected and with the rise of China as a global superpower, I do think that that body of literature is going to become increasingly extensive and significant, for sure. Yes? You talk about organization. Yes. And you see it through their empire and their terms of their law, their organization, their military. Yes. But you don't see them pushing their religion. The, the Roman religion? Mm -hmm. Is it because they recognize that it would not be accepted? Or that it was too great of a challenge to try and change parts of the empire for their beliefs? The question is, um, you know, Romanization is threading its way through all of these different aspects of the Roman Empire. Why are, is religion something that doesn't really catch on? And the answer to that is I'm not completely sure. Um, from what I have, I have read, the, the Romans were largely very tolerant of local religions. They didn't really try to impose um, their religion on anybody else, with the exception of the Christians. Like, this is sort of the major issue. Uh, you know, they, they, and part of that is that you know, Christianity in some ways threatens um, the, very, the very kind of foundations of Roman unity. And some of this is centered on you know, the emperor is the seat of power. You really can't question his authority. So I think in some ways, you know, Christians are um, a special case. But, you know, the answer is I'm not 100% sure why they didn't try to push their religion on everybody else. Um, I know that a lot of people did end up kind of adopting it uh, simply as a matter of expediency. Um, but it could have been that the further that you got away from, you know, the imperial center, the less significant the Roman religion really was, unless you were in the military. Um, in which case, you know, the military had a certain, uh, like, um, observances that they would do, uh, and so you would become familiar with the religion in that way. But otherwise, unfortunately, that's one of my gray areas, and I apologize for that. In two weeks, we'll talk about that. <laughs> yes. I, I was just going to say, would it be because that everything was a god? That there were so many gods in the area that the Romans could accept anybody for worshiping anything? That's just my own thought. My question is, after 25 years of service in the military, and I know, you know, I'm not, I understand things aren't always fair. How did they determine who got the beachfront problem? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. The question is, um, how did they determine who got what uh, plot of land? you know, when it came after you did your 25 years of service. And the answer is to begin with, um, there was always, you know, very early on, uh, you know, the Italian peninsula would be divvied up amongst, you know, ex-soldiers. And so, you know, the really good land is what kind of goes first. Uh, in the later part of the empire, what ultimately we see happening is that uh, you just kind of end up with land wherever you happen to be garrisoned, as a matter of expediency. So they would simply hand out, you know, you would be handed a plot of land. And in all honesty, I'm not sure whether this was something that was random or if it helped if you knew someone, you know, uh, or you know, if you were in good with, with the consul at that time period uh, of that particular area, if maybe you could uh, finagle some really good, as you put it, beachfront property. I'm not sure to what extent uh, that was an influence. I would imagine in some areas, certainly it helped if you knew the right people and you had established the right connections over, over time. But for the most part, if you were just a very poor, very common soldier, you were just incredibly happy to be out of the military. Uh, and you would take whatever they could give you and hope, for, and hope that enough would be productive at the very least you know, to feed your family. Uh, it was Constantine who made Christian, yeah, Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. 
just a matter of curiosity, would that be, uh, would there be a thin thread that would come through from that practice to the practice after like the Revolutionary War in the United States, where a lot of the Eastern states had Western portions like Connecticut Western Reserve and so on, where they would apportion segments of land to people who had served as soldiers in the Revolutionary War. Did, did that become sort of a standard way of acting in Europe then? The question is, you know, was, was it, was it, let me make sure I, I understood the question clearly here. Um, was, it, was it standard practice to kind of es to establish uh, these land territories that were near, near garrisons, right, uh, to, to, to take this territory and sort of absorb it into the Roman Empire in part? Right. No, not, not necessarily. I was saying just the practice where like revolutionary war heroes and so on would be given land a, as a result of their service. Was it similar to the, the Roman garrison okay. receiving land at the end of their service? Yes, yes. That, that is, it's a, that's actually a very good comparison. It was very similar to that. Um, and yeah, getting land, getting land at the end of, of their service was a reward for 25 years of you know sacrificing blood, sweat, tears, whatever, um, to the empire. That was their. It was a pension. It was their way of saying thank you. This is how the you know you have helped to secure the empire. The empire is going to secure you. And of course, you know we know that that this sort of varied person to person depending on where you ended up and what kind of plot of land you got. Um, but yes, it was very much meant to be a reward that was in many ways self-sustaining. You know, it was meant to continue to maintain that loyalty for, the, for these former soldiers, uh, to continue to maintain that loyalty to the empire itself, and in the process, you know, continue to secure these problematic provinces. And as you move more and more into the empire itself, from the republic, it secured the loyalty of the troops to the general who wanted to be the emperor. <laughs> Uh, we have uh, used up our hour and a half time. Uh, Dr. Constance, thank you very, very much. Your first time out of the doctor, wonderful. We 